Understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful sea. On the way, on the way. Back in 1840, a young man called Edward Eyre camped for the night near here, on the northern fringe of the Flinders Ranges. Eyre had been hoping that the Rangers would lead him all the way to the heart of Australia. Now, they'd petered out. Ahead lay the plains, vast, featureless, mysterious. Most of Australia, nearly four-fifths of it, was still completely uncharted by Europeans. Air stood on the threshold of unknown lands twice the size of India. They were inhabited lands by people superbly tuned to desert survival. But for Europeans, there was no more daunting and dangerous unknown country on Earth. Still today, a journey to Central Australia is an adventure, and something more. You don't just see Australia's heart, you feel it. A hundred years ago, before civilization had even heard of Central Australia, the world was already said to have seven natural wonders. That's why I call the centre the Eighth Wonder. Fly to the centre and experience all its wonders except for one. The awesome sense of remoteness is something you only get from driving. These days it's an easy road, but you can still imagine what it was like for early explorers. No roads, no maps, no landmarks. A day's march wouldn't get you to the horizon. After a week or a month of days like that, impassable country might still force you back on your tracks. Most inland explorers saw their dreams of great rivers and rich pastures vanish in dust. But few who did make it back ever seemed to regret the journey. full, Lake Eyre is Australia's biggest lake, but it's only been full a couple of times this century. Most of the time, Lake Eyre is a sea of salt. This is as far as Edward Eyre got in his first journey north from the Flinders Ranges. He thought the lake completely blocked the way and decided against trying to get across, and I don't blame him. 
These salt lakes not only look like the Antarctic ice flows, they match them for treachery. I'll show you what I mean. Usually, the heavily loaded pack animals would crash through first, and without their precious loads of food and water, the whole party would perish. More than one expedition founded in a desperate attempt to get animals out of mud like this. Air wasn't lucky enough to see the truly magic transformation that comes over the lake about once in a lifetime. Most recently, back in 1974. It takes freakish rain over vast tracts of the inland to fill Lake Eyre, but when it does happen, it makes the lake briefly what all desert explorers searched for, but never found. Australia's mythical inland sea. Unable to cross, Air turned west on a nightmarish trek which would take him across the arid Nullarbor Plain. It would be a further 20 years before any explorer would reach Australia's centre. Midway between Adelaide and Alice Springs, which is to say more or less in the middle of nowhere, is civilization. Well, a town anyway, Minterby. You wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination call Minterby scenic. But this has to be one of the most remarkable towns in the world. In Minterby, I caught up with an old friend of mine, Yvonne Dorwood. And I had to ask her the obvious question. What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? My lifestyle was... Um all go. Uh, I like the fast lane. Um, I like jet setting around the world and um, I like mink coats and uh, Mercedes cars and um, living in Point Piper. Uh, I used to get married a lot and I uh, didn't do too well in that department, I'm afraid, and um, I don't have the necessity these days to do that sort of thing anymore. Um, I much prefer to live out here where, uh, you know, plenty of peace and quietness and I'm myself. Obviously something special must bring people here, and so it does. This desolate country just happens to contain some of the richest opal fields in the world. Some people think Australia is the only country with opals. That's not true. We just happen to have the most and the best. A good strike here could be worth millions of dollars. It's a paradise for an artist, you know. It's so colourful, it's red sand hills and blue hills in the distance and, uh, and the people are so colourful. I like characters. I'm a people artist. Some of them drink too much, fight too much. No, they don't fight very much, but they, um, they uh, uh, always appears to be quite a bit of drama. And uh, there's people on their last legs, you know, like saving their money um, furiously so they can put another test hole down and uh, so that they'll strike opal and uh, manage to survive. And uh, there's always this quiet desperation underlying everything, you know. And then there's the total joy when somebody uh, has a strike. You know? 
course no one says that they have but everybody knows it and it's all very it's all very exciting and and uh very alive and and passionate if you like i love passion i'm right into passion just one final word of caution before you pack your bags and head out to Minterby. Remember that close to 65% of miners go broke, chasing their dream. The first expeditions to the centre were like land voyages on uncharted oceans. The plains were the seas, the dunes, the waves. And as sailors search for islands, so the explorers too scanned the horizon in search of landmarks. In different country, Chambers Pillar might go unnoticed. Here, it becomes a powerful presence, a beacon. Chambers Pillar points the way, and from here, early explorers turned west to discover the great scenic treasures of the centre, the McDonnell Ranges, Ayers Rock and the Olgas. <laughs> the first explorer to really soak up the centre's wonders was a man named Ernest Giles. He set out to follow the dry gorge of the Fink River, or, as Aboriginals call it, the Larapinta, meaning snake, a name that suits its winding course much better. The Fink is believed to be one of the world's oldest rivers. It was carved out millions of years ago, when the centre was tropically green and wet, great rivers rolled across the plains. Nowadays, the Larapinta behaves in the strange way of all the centre's rivers. Instead of gathering strength, it peters out. The sun steals the river away faster than it can replenish itself, long before it gets to the sea. To a lot of explorers, natural features were just reference points for their maps. But to Giles, they were places of wonder, because he took time to explore. He was rewarded when the Fink River led him to one of the true marvels of the center, a place he called Glen of Palms, and described it as Peculiar indeed. Today, there are fewer palms than in Giles' time, but they are peculiar indeed. The descendants of plants that were washed here millions of years ago, when oceans did in fact flow to Australia's heart. The species of palms, just a few thousand trees, is unique to this one valley in all the world. Like most of the early explorers, Ernest Giles usually described his journeys as if he had the place to himself. Believe me, that wasn't the case. All through this country, he would have been closely watched. Giles was no threat to the Aboriginals of the centre, but within a few years of his visit, the first white settlement had grown up around this freshwater spring. Imagine thin strands of wire stretching across 3,000 kilometres of wilderness, the only link between nine tiny settlements like this. As early as 1876, 500 men had battled nature an unknown country to complete an extraordinary feat of human endurance. They had driven a telegraph line overland from south to north, from Adelaide to Darwin. For Australia, 
It meant the end of isolation. Cables could now be sent direct to and from Europe. But for the Morse operators and linesmen who manned remote repeater stations like this, it meant the beginning of isolation. Few settlers ever led more lonely lives. There were also elements of danger. Aboriginals understandably resented the white intrusion into their country, and the next station north of here at Barra Creek was attacked. Two linesmen were injured, one of them dying. The dying man managed to get to the Morse Key. His wife, 1,800 kilometres away in Adelaide, was called to the telegraph base, and there she heard her husband's last message, a message of love, tapped out in Morse code. The telegraph station has been beautifully preserved, and it's one around which a city grew, the city of Alice Springs. If any of those old Morse code tappers and wire menders came back today, they wouldn't believe their eyes. All very nice, but modern Alice Springs could be any town. The Alice had to grow to cope with the visitors that these days flocked to the centre, but I think it could have been done without changing the character of what was once a pretty unique outback town. Catering for tourists has also brought some good new ideas. I'm sure Giles would have given all his camels to have had one of these. sights of the centre are the mountains nobody ever expected to find at Australia's heart. And what better way to see them than this? With an eye for a good view, balloonist Michael Sandby takes his tourists up, up and away, seven days a week. Dramatic McDonnell Ranges, 500 kilometres east to west. You could rightly call this Australia's backbone. These ridges are only skeletal remains of mountains that once towered ten times as high. In a dozen places, deep canyons cut the range. It's these gorges that make the McDonald's not just spectacular, but a wonderland. stuff and the takeoff was beautifully smooth but I'm told that it's a bit more exciting as we land so I better get ready. Come on. Two hands and ski position. Is that right Mike? That's correct. Skiing position. Skiing position. Okay folks, get down first. Okay, okay. Right through the tree.
If you hadn't travelled to the centre before, you could be forgiven for thinking of it as Australia's dead heart. But it's far from dead. As a local, I've travelled through here a hundred times before, but I always seem to find some fresh wonder. It's not hard to see why this country captivated the first explorers, or why it's drawn painters, poets, adventurers and dreamers ever since. Imagine pushing a barrow over 200 kilometres like this. Only gold fever could make a human want to try it. Back in the 1880s, there was a gold rush to the McDonnell Ranges, to a place called Altunga. It wasn't the richest field, but it was certainly one of the toughest. Imagine putting in a summer here. Temperatures constantly around 40 degrees Celsius, millions of flies and rock-hard ground baked dry by a relentless sun. Whew, it's hot out here. They'd have been queuing up to get in there. The Altunga Jail, definitely the coolest spot in town. The gorges provide one thing most of the centre lacks. Cool, fresh, permanent water. Each gorge has a distinct character. Ormiston is deep and rugged. A wild place of vivid colour and fractured rock. It creates what, to me, is an almost perfect oasis. You could camp out here for the rest of your life. Stanley Chasm is more hectic. Every day, a flood of a different kind pours through here just before midday. Incredibly narrow, the sun only reaches into the chasm for a few minutes each day. So it's lights, camera and action. But if you care to wait until one o'clock, the sun is still around, the gorge is still here, and the nicest thing of all is, you can usually have the place to yourself. Well, almost. There's one gorge I want to show you that's so narrow you can't even see it from the air, but it's so spectacular that to miss it is to miss one of the great natural wonders of the world. Until 1988, you couldn't have explored Red Bank Gorge without swimming. But the big floods of that year filled its deep pools with gravel 
and for several months you could walk through the very heart of the mountain. Imagine a gemstone weighing billions of tons, a polished gemstone because rock tumbled through the gorge during floods has scoured the sides until they shine. That's Red Bank Gorge. Well, Red Bank, I feel as though my batteries are charged again. Birdie can, birdie can, I'm in. The Fink River that our old friend Ernest Giles followed cuts through the McDonnell Ranges here at Glen Helen Gorge. It's a favourite spot of mine. Aboriginal people call this waterhole Japala and they have a legend to match its mystery. It was from here, so they say, that the first shapeless human forms emerged to inhabit the centre. <laughs> Many a hot, dusty traveller's done just that. Dived into one of these pools in the middle of summer, only to finish up with cramps. It's deep and it's freezing, but it's lovely. This is as far north as Giles got in his trek up the Larapinta. The waterhole stopped him and he didn't try to swim Japala, but he did climb to the top of the ridge to be rewarded by one of the centre's spectacular views, Mount Sonda. These days, nowhere in the centre is really too far off the beaten track. Built at the mouth of the gorge, Glen Helen is now a comfortable tourist resort. It's a far cry from the old Glen Helen homestead that cattleman Brian Bowman once called home. Come on, take me back to three years at Glen Helen. OK. Well, Brian, the old homestead's changed, but the scenery's still the same. Oh, yes. Well, the scenery uh, will be the same, I suppose, for a thousand when years. When Brian first came here in 1939, the only track in was a camel pad. Uh, yes. It took three weeks to get supplies from Alice. To survive here at all, you had to be self-sufficient. You must be pleased to see the old meat house restored. Yes, it's very nice uh, to see that back again. As I say, it, um, after all the misadventures it's had. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the rushes and the... Yes, yeah, the... it's exactly the same uh, way as it was. And so you'd have used this old oh, cle yes. cleaver a few times. You'd be a dangerous man with this in your hand. Oh, well, as I say, it, was quite, it might have been quite handy at times, <laughs> you know, that. Uh, the fresh meat would be hung on the uh, on a rail across there, and uh, the salt meat in bags on a bench over there. Oh, yeah. And every night the salt meat would be put out to uh, dry, mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, it uh, would uh, go sour if it was left in the bag. How long did You'd think salt meat wouldn't be much of a diet, but Brian got by out here well enough to surprise two visiting dietitians. They said, what do you have for breakfast? I said, well, meat and bread. And they said, what do you have for dinner? Well, I said, bread and meat. And uh, what do you have for supper? Well, I said, meat and bread again. So uh, they said, uh, yes, well, um, and uh, the one or two other bodies said, according to all our theories, you should have been dead years ago. Cattle going in, we mustered them in dry and rain. Cattle going in. From Mulga Flat and Saltbush Plain, 
cattle going in We're yarding cattle from the west Swing wide the gates and draft the best Let down the rails and bush the rest Cattle going in Cattle going in The shades of old time drovers stare At cattle going in Their ghostly horses snort and glare At cattle going in Road trains roaring over land Their drivers couldn't understand The months it took that vanished band With cattle going in Cattle going in Surprisingly, this is much sweeter cattle country than it looks. Known as top feed country, beef from round here regularly tops the southern markets. But bringing in the cattle also brought conflict. And this was the reason. Water. The cattlemen wanted exclusive access to these permanent water holes. Many of them were sacred places, but more importantly than that, the water itself and the game it supported were absolutely essential to Aboriginal survival. The pioneer cattlemen came in no more than a year or two behind explorers like Ernest Giles, and there's no question that brutal violence towards Aboriginals was a fact in those early days. At Hermansburg it was different. The Lutheran missionaries that settled here as early as 1876 made the same hard trek as the cattlemen, but with very different motives. Nowadays, missionaries aren't too fashionable. But though they made some mistakes, they nonetheless created a place of refuge. Perhaps the people of the Aranda tribe survive here at some cost to their culture and survival. But without the missionaries, they may not have survived at all. It was here in the 1930s that the painter Albert Namajira was encouraged to throw away tradition in favour of painting European style. Namajira's paintings brought him fame and money, but not much happiness. The white world that had admired his paintings rejected the man. In my call I ask, Namajira, are your people well? Undumwara, Undumwaro, are your people well?
least one positive in the Aboriginal story is that their traditional painting now gets a lot more respect than it did in Namajira's day. Maybe we can't understand all the symbolism of work like this, but we can still admire it as powerful graphic art. Today, work like this is prized all over the world and recognised as one of the wonders of Aboriginal Australia. These people are the Wildbury, friends of mine, as well as people I've worked with for many years. It's not easy to wipe the slate clean after a century of destruction, but these women are doing their best helping children regain their old inheritance. We call them Marlo, white men call them Kangaroo. This is Marlo, we tell them the Aboriginal names, because, and we tell them English, like Kangaroo track. Tracking skills of Aboriginal people are legendary. These days it's a bit of a game, but for thousands of years, these skills were vital arts of survival. We're off on a search for a goanna, which they pride as good bush tucker. This is goanna tail and goanna track, chikun taroy. No goanna, nothing. No luck this time. The goanna had gone. Finding the next meal takes time, skill, and a lot of patience. We got nothing here. We can't buy anything. It's worth reminding yourself that in the old days, this wasn't a game. Failure in a hunt like this meant going hungry. Got. Is this Luachiri? Quite a big fella. Old skills can still fill the cooking pot. Maybe the real challenge is passing those skills on to the next generation. <laughs> If we have to end our journey somewhere, then there's only one place to head, south. South towards the centre's three biggest attractions. No, it's not Uluru, and it's not the Olgas. It's the one I call the Forgotten Mountain, Artila, Mount Connor. Much less well known, but in its own way, every bit as spectacular. Connor is 
massive. Its tabletop, nearly a thousand metres above sea level, cutting it off from the plains below like Conan Doyle's lost world. Just imagine how it felt being the first person to see Uluru and the Olgas shimmering in the distance. In any setting they'd be impressive. Lying here at Australia's heart, they become both an imponderable mystery and an awesome presence. Standard picture of Central Australia. Blue skies, shimmering heat waves, blazing red rocks. But I like to be in a place like Olga Gorge on a day like today, a moody day. Fascinating. The Olgas were central to Aboriginal beliefs and legends, very special ceremonial grounds. Of course, they didn't call them the Olgas. And when the wind whips round these domes, it's their name for the place that you seem to hear. A magical, musical name. Katajuta, Katajuta, Katajuta. It's hard to break the spell of a place like this, but we have to, because the big one is still to come. Imagine Mount Connor tipped on its side and half buried like an iceberg, so only the top half shows. This is Uluru, the world's largest monolith, one solid piece of rock. In itself, that's a startling fact, but it doesn't explain the human reaction to Uluru. It has fast become the mecca of every pilgrimage to the centre. The latest theory is there was a part of an inland sea. It's very well known that Australia has been underwater several central Australia several times over 600 million years. And you try and imagine 600 million years in your own mind. The average human brain is able to imagine approximately 100 years. Over that, we're pretty well. You know, unable to imagine much more. The and coach captains do their best to give a scientific explanation, but I feel science alone will never be able to explain the spell that Uluru casts. Not so much something you see and hear, but something you feel. So this is it, the climax of the pilgrimage, the climb of Uluru. I've done the climb mobs of times before, but I never ever take it for granted. It's exhilarating, but it's dangerous. So I'll leave the bike at home. Well, how was it? Was it good? Well, yeah, well, well, well done. Well, done. Well, take a look at me, I'm not puffing, am I? Oh, you're looking great. <laughs> the climb's deceptive. Although only 357 metres above the plain, it's definitely not for the unfit. 20 people have died making this climb. So what drives us to come to Uluru and climb the rock? I don't think it's just to get to the top. Maybe it's 
so we can feel just for a while a part of it. A part of Australia's heart. So how do you sum it up? Not just the centre itself, but the way we react to it. Some people think that this country is only important to Aboriginals, but I don't know about that. I think that ever since anyone else has been coming here, the centre has become more and more important to all of us. Not bad at all. Ever since Eyre and Giles, everyone who comes here has this great sense of wonderment. So maybe what we learn at Australia's heart is a great sense of truth. If imagination is what makes a human being, we learn here just how much we've all got in common. Nice thought. So let's sit back now and enjoy what everyone who comes on a pilgrimage to the centre comes to see.